Hi, I'm Doug Arnold. I'm a professor of mathematics at the University of Minnesota, and I'm delighted to be here to talk to you about mathematics that swings, the math behind golf. So what's golf have to do with math? Well, I'm a mathematician. Many people would call me an applied mathematician or a computational mathematician. And I've gotten in the habit where almost everything I look at, I see math. This is a reductive viewpoint in some ways, but I want to convince you today that it's also a very powerful viewpoint. The basic paradigm is that many, many systems can be modeled with more or less fidelity by a mathematical model, and more or less insight can be gotten out of that mathematical model through mathematical analysis and computational simulation. Golf is no exception, and that's the one I'm going to talk about today. Why did I choose golf? Well, it sort of chose me. I was contacted by an advertising agency working with ExxonMobil to produce a series of te television public service ads on the theme of math and science are everywhere. That's a great theme from my point of view, so I eagerly joined. And one of the first ones was a public service ad that would be uh, shown during the Augusta Masters Tournament of Golf. And it was about Phil Mickelson swinging the golf club, and my job was to provide all the math that was behind that in the form of equations that could be incorporated in the ad. A good golf swing accelerates the club head, which is about a half a pound, from 0 to 120 miles an hour in a quarter of a second. That's more than 20 g's of acceleration. And the question is, how do you do that? How do you do that most effectively? So there's Phil swinging. And what you see is that his arms are very straight and rigid. And coming from his arms are the straight shaft of the golf club. And that, of course, pivots around. He applies a pivot both at his shoulders and with his wrists. And in that way, he's able to accelerate the club head, which is half a pound, from 0 to 120 miles an hour in a quarter of a second, way over any sports car. So let's make a mathematical model out of this. From the rigidity of the triangle formed by the shoulders and the arms, we can replace that with just a rod going from the center of the shoulders to the wrist. I have put that in orange in this diagram. And then another rod, the golf club shaft, goes from the wrist down to the weight of the club head. I can describe the state of the system at any given moment in terms of two angles, which you see in the diagram, theta and phi. And these things change in time. They're functions of time, depending on the torques that are provided with the wrist and with the shoulders. That can be captured in two equations of the type that are used to describe pendulums. This is just a double pendulum. And those two differential equations are on the bottom of the slide. You don't need to understand the equations, but let me tell you what the Letters stand for theta and phi are our angles. Theta dot and phi dot are then the angular velocities, and theta double dot and phi double dot the accelerations. A, B, and C take into account the weights and the lengths of the various constituents. And tau zero and tau h are the two torques that one can apply. This is a set of two differential equations in the two unknown angles. It's set up using Newton's law, and that can be solved using a computer to solve it that can be solved very accurately in order to predict the movement of the club and event the speeds that are achieved. So that's a very gross simplification of the complicated thing, all the things that go on in the muscles of Phil Mickelson and in the club and, uh, and the club head and the shaft. It's bending, the friction, the air resistance, and so forth. Only a tiny bit of that is captured in this model, but the double pendulum model is remarkably useful for a, a number of purposes. It leads to an, a number of interesting insights. For example, it tells you that you shouldn't apply a torque at the wrist. You should let your wrists behave as a free uh, swing freely. And this is captured well in this statement by uh, statistician George Box, who said, all mathematical models are wrong, but some are useful. And the art of making useful mathematical models is a key thing that I'd like to discuss. So let's move on from that first quarter of a second where the golfer accelerates the club to the impact, which is only a two thousandth of a second, the time between um, when the golf club impacts on the ball and when the ball uh, uh, departs from the golf club. So during that time, most of the momentum of the club head is transferred to the ball, and that's something we want to understand with a mathematical model. Here's a picture of it. Uh, in a time-lapse photography, this is two thousandth of a second, as I said. And you see at the beginning and the end, when the ball is coming in or going out, uh, it's perfectly spherical, 
but in the middle, it's very, very compressed. It's like a very, very compressed spring. And as that spring uncompresses in the last few frames, uh, that's when the ball uh, picks up its momentum. So modeling this is very straightforward. It was Newton who gave us the equations, just like for the double pendulum, those are Newton's equations. But uh, the double pendulum were differential equations, and these are just algebraic equations. They can be solved exactly just using high school algebra. So we write down the momentum of an object, which is its mass times its velocity. We have it for the club, we have it for the ball, and the kinetic energy, which is a half the mass times the velocity squared. And then we use conservation to tell us the momentum before, which is the club's uh, initial uh, momentum, thanks to the uh, acceleration of the club by the golfer, should equal the momentum after, which is the new lower momentum of the club due to its new velocity after impact, and the momentum of the ball. And then we take a similar conservation for law for the kinetic energy, and then we solve those two algebraic equations and the two unknowns to find the velocity of the club and the ball after impact. In particular, if you look at that final equation, you see the velocity of the ball is the velocity that the, came in with the club times a factor that's a little bit less than two, depending on the mass ratio. So already we've learned a nice insight from very simple algebra that no matter how hard you hit that ball, it will never go off any faster, actually it'll go off slower than twice the speed you come in at. And finally, I'll go to the most complicated part of tonight's lecture, which is the flight of the golf ball after it leaves the tee. So at that point, the, the golfer has no control, but what happens is of great importance. So the question is, if we know the speed at which the golf ball leads the tee, and we know the direction it's initially pointed in, where will it land? What will its trajectory be? That's a question that calculus instructors ask their students all the time. And uh, it leads to pictures like this one of a parabola. So you take the velocity of the ball and you break it into two components, a horizontal velocity that stays constant because there are no forces in the horizontal direction, and a vertical velocity that has a quadratic downward pointing behavior because of the acceleration of gravity. So we always get a parabola from these problems and that makes the algebra rather simple to answer the questions. So the answer to our question, what's the trajectory of the ball, seems to be a downward pointing parabola. So let's compare that to reality. Here is a picture using uh, a sensor technology that lets you trace the trajectory of a ball hit by Phil Mickelson. This is a terrific drive at the Buick Invitational at Torrey Pines. But you see it looks anything but like a parabola. If it's, certainly if it's a parabola, it's a parabola concave up like a cup, not concave down like a bowl but it reaches its peak at some point that doesn't appear to be anywhere near the middle, and then it goes down on nearly a straight line. So what's wrong with our calculus model? Well, all models are wrong, but some are useful. This one is not useful. In the beginning of the calculus problem, there's usually some fine print that says, neglecting air resistance, calculate the trajectory. We can neglect air resistance, but the golf ball doesn't neglect air resistance. It's extremely important in the game of golf. Imagine, for example, you're sitting in a car, the air is carried along the car with you, you hold up your hand, you don't feel anything. Put it out the window, you can't neglect air resistance, it'll be pulled back and you'll feel it very strongly. That's acting on a golf ball. So air resistance can be broken up in two components, just like we broke up the ball velocity in two components, but now one component is named drag, and that's the force pushing backwards on the ball, trying to hold it back. And the other is called lift, which is perpendicular to that and helps keep the ball aloft. They're both extremely important in golf, but let's concentrate on drag. So the question is, can we add drag and lift to our mathematical model to get a more realistic trajectory of the golf ball? So you have to understand drag and lift, and it turns out they are not easy to model mathematically. This question came to the fore in the beginning of the 20th century after the Wright brothers had their first flight. And one of the key people to study drag was Gustav Eiffel. He had built his new tower and was looking for interesting things to do, and he started to study aeronautics. He built a laboratory in the Eiffel Tower and used it to measure drag. In 1912, this paid off because he made a completely surprising discovery, now known as Eiffel's paradox, or the drag crisis. It's shown on this graph, 
which shows the drag as pounds of force pushing backwards on a smooth sphere according to its speed, which is varying from about 80 miles an hour to 400 miles an hour. And you see, as you'd expect, if you've ever put your hand out of the window in a moving car, you feel the drag on it. The faster you go, the more drag you feel. But actually, Eiffel's parallax says that at a certain point, all of a sudden, the drag goes down. That's huge for golf. It's huge for air aviation. But why does it happen? You'd think the faster you go, the more you'd be feeling a pushback on you. So that was called Eiffel's paradox, or the drag crisis. And the person who figured it out was this person, who's sort of the hero of this talk, Ludwig Prandtl. He was an interdisciplinary scientist, engineer, scientist, mathematician. You see him doing experiments in the beginning of the century and coming up with the boundary layer, which is that thin layer of fluid that sticks to the ball as it goes around the ball for a while and then separates off, leaving a trailing wake. Very important, that trailing wake, because there's a low pressure area that slows down the ball. Prandtl studied this both experimentally, as shown in this picture, but especially mathematically, and he presented his work in the 1904 International Congress of Mathematicians, one of the most important papers of fluid dynamics. This is a, the diagram is a picture from Prandtl's paper explaining how pressure, higher pressure at the back of the ball forces the flow to backwards and eventually to reverse itself and that's when the boundary layer separates. And the other two pictures are much more recent experiments that match Prandtl's theory and showed that using the power of mathematics, he had a microscope that was exactly spot on. Then when he heard about the Eiffel paradox, and the drag crisis, he tried to apply his theory and succeeded, it took him about five years, to explain how it works. So I don't have time to go into the details, but basically the key is, in order to have boundary layer separation happen later, what you'd like to do is have your boundary layer turbulent, so it mixes the air, fast air going by the golf ball to the slow air stuck at the ball. Therefore, extra turbulence decreases drag and makes the ball go further. And so the key is to induce that turbulence, and that's what all these patterns of dimples and ridges on golf balls are for. Well, golfers had discovered that about half a century before when the first rubber golf balls were invented. These rubber golf balls came out, came out and they found they didn't go as far as the old leather golf balls, but then they found that as they got older and scuffed, they tended to go further. Nobody had an idea why this was true, but golfers are a superstitious lot and they started uh, coming up with different patterns and beating patterns into the golf balls that eventually evolved in today's gimple, uh, dimpled golf ball. And actually new dimple patterns are being in, developed all the time. There's something like a thousand patents. And a big open question is what's the best distribution of dimples, shape, number, depth, in order to have the golf balls go as far as possible? If we want to answer that question, we need more than mathematical analysis. The mathematical models that are available are sufficient, but they can't be solved analytically. In fact, the key one is the Navier-Stokes equation, and there's a million dollar prize offered for anyone who can even prove that it has a solution that lasts for all time. But what we can do is we can use computational simulation, and these pictures show some of the state-of-the-art computational simulations of a golf ball. They show the flow past a dimpled golf ball at fairly high speeds, not as high as a real golf ball travels, but getting in the range. Um, unfortunately, the golf ball is not spinning, which means they're missing entirely lift, and this is not quite sufficient, but it's a great start by the group of Kyle Squires et al. How come we can do computations like that now? If you go back to 1950 when the computer was invented, um, John von Neumann, one of the inventors, started to use it for science. And the first scientific computation paper was published by Jules Charney, Ragnar Fjortov, and von Neumann in 1950. And they did climate science. They tried to measure the climate over North America. They were able to put 270 grid points into their computer code and solve the equations for them. And it took them about 24 hours to do a 24-hour weather simulation. And it was so coarse that they missed entire hurricanes. Now, fast forward 60 years to when Squire's group is modeling flow over a dimpled golf ball. This picture shows the flow over one dimple. For the whole simulation, they use 1.2 billion grid points. Why can we do 1.2 billion grid points now when we could only do 270 half a century ago? 
Well, of course, you're probably thinking computers are a lot better, and they certainly are. Moore's law has been doubling the speed of computers every year and a half. However, that's not the whole story or even the biggest part of the story. You also have a great change in the algorithms. So back in the 50s, one was using Gaussian elimination to solve linear equations. Then the Gauss-Seidel method and the optimal SOR method was introduced in the 60s, the conjugate gradient method, up till today's best algorithms like full multigrid. And these have sped things up by a factor not of 10 million, but by 100 billion. We're now in a world where mathematical modeling, mathematical analysis, and ingenious scientific computation can tell us a whole lot about a whole lot. Thank you.